Well, I mean, it's not escaped anyone's notice that we live in um, a winner take all world uh, of uh, digital platforms. And given that digital platforms mediate so much of our life, the fact that it is a winner take all world has many knock on effects. So you may have seen this morning uh, or, or over the weekend, rather, there were there were unredacted documents released by the attorneys general who are suing Facebook uh, that revealed the bid rigging um, and uh, other collusive behavior with Google uh, to um, take money both from creators, publishers, and also from advertisers. Both sides of that market, of that two-sided market, are very important to the question of equitable enterprise, right? So the how do you attract customers, which is the advertising side of it, and then how do you uh, realize a wage for your creative or other online labor is the is the ad placement side of it. And it turns out that Google and Facebook were were robbing from us on both sides of that. I mean, literally, just there's not really any way to 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 describe the conduct except for um, uh, fraud or, or theft, you know, they, they, you know, there were instances, for example, in which um, Google would be running the auction and bidding in the auction, and someone would bid higher than Google, and Google would reject that bid and place their own bid. So they would, uh, so, so the, the publisher would therefore get less money for the ad that was being shown. So, I mean, I don't want to labor this point too much, and maybe in the Q&A we can talk more about the, the question of uh, monopoly, monopoly and um, uh, self-determination and equitable enterprise. What I do want to talk about is why the uh, industry is shaped the way it is, how we got to this place where we see um, a very high degree of concentration uh, north of 80% of um, ad markets uh, are controlled by Facebook and Google. For example, uh, we have two mobile operators uh, and their two app stores account for effectively 100% of all mobile apps uh, and so on. And when economists talk about it, uh, whether or not they're hostile to big tech, they tend to lean into a network effects grounded account of the the concentration of the sector. Um, they say that that these firms enjoy classic network effects. Uh, you know, the um, you joined Facebook because your friends were there. Now that you're using Facebook, other people want to join because you're there. And so you have this this kind of circularity. And it's true that network effects do account for uh, big tech growth. Uh, when you look at the platforms, you really do see that like once Apple has a critical mass of people who use iPhones, they attract more uh, iOS developers. The more apps there are in the App Store, the more reasons there are to become uh, an iPhone user. And so they attract more users. Uh, but the incompleteness of that account is really important. So there, there's two aspects I want to talk about. The first is not interoperability, but I just want to touch on it. And the second is, is a pure interoperability story. So the first part of it is predatory acquisition. Um, you know, Google today runs the second largest display advertising market in the world with YouTube. Google tried to launch its own video service. They had a service called Google Video. They failed. They, you know, whether it's because Clay Christensen is right and they had the innovator's dilemma or because they just got unlucky or because they had were too top heavy structurally to be able to do things that might cannibalize their own businesses. Google was not capable of making a video network. Instead, they bought one, right? They bought they bought a really successful one called YouTube. And that's how they came to control the second largest size of this. In fact, when you look at Google, it's a company that has only made one and a half successful products. Uh, they made a really good search engine, a pretty good Hotmail clone. And everything else that they've made that succeeded is uh, something they bought from someone else. Their entire ad tech stack. They had an ad tech stack. It didn't work. They bought someone else's ad tech stack. Uh, even the stuff that they where they can have a pretty good claim uh, on the operational side to have done a lot of domestic development, it mostly starts with an exogenous seed. So their server management, uh, their, their uh, automated ticketing systems, source uh, repositories, all that infrastructure stuff that's not inside of us, that's all acquisitions, right? Vertical acquisition. Um, and you know, to, to really put a button on that point, 
they've made a lot of in-house products, right? A lot of in-house products, all of which have failed without exception, except for Google Photos, which is a thing that only succeeded because it came bundled with a mobile operating system they bought from someone else. So they're all, all failures. So there's a, a strong argument to be made that if we main, had maintained the presumption against vertical merger, Google would just be a lot less dangerous, right? They wouldn't be in a place to do wage theft, right? They wouldn't be in a place to, uh, you know, one of the things that, that emerged from the, um, the Facebook papers today is that uh, Google and uh, Facebook colluded to suppress privacy regulation at the state level. Right. They just wouldn't have had they wouldn't have had the dry powder. Right. They wouldn't have the monopoly rents. They wouldn't have had the extensive power. Hell, if they weren't running an ad network, they may, might not have had the motivation to to suppress uh, child privacy rules. Right. If they were if they were a customer of an ad network, because there's more than one way to build an ad network. They don't have to be privacy invasive in Europe. As we see a step up of enforcement of privacy rules, we're seeing uh, content based ad networks emerge instead of uh, um, user based behavioral ones. You don't need to spy on the user to, to show them an ad. You can look at the fact that they're reading about socks and then show them an ad for socks, or you can measure the correlates of reading articles and say, oh, well, people who read these articles are likely to want to buy socks. So I'll show them the ad because they're they're looking at a, an article about shoes and I'll show them an ad about socks. You don't have to spy on the user to, to, to get that stuff. So that's the, that's the not interoperability point. But the interoperability point is the one that I really, really want to bear down on today. And it's the role that interoperability plays in lowering switching costs and the significance of switching costs to maintaining the gains that are uh, uh, realized through network effects. So Facebook might build a huge user base through network effects in the same way that say Western Digital built a huge uh, user base for those old black rotary dial bell phones that we all used to pay to rent every month uh, through network effects. But um, the way that they maintained that uh, dominance, Western Digital, was by uh, uh, getting a, a regulator, getting the FCC, to prohibit third parties from connecting things to their network. And that prohibition was far reaching. So the, the first seminal case about this involved a company called Hushaphone. And Hushaphone <laughs> made a plastic cup that went over the mouthpiece of your phone so that people couldn't hear you. And AT&T argued that this device endangered the integrity of the bell system and threatened both national safety and security. Because if any Yahoo could plug something into their Western digital phone, who knew what could happen? Well, as soon as the regulator said, I'm sorry, that's a bridge too far. We're not going to stop uh, third parties from mechanically coupling things to the bell system. Um, the fact that they had this network effect, that there were a million billion phones that were all identical, that they had standardized, was just a bonanza for companies like Hushaphone, right? What, what had been a walled garden became a feedlot, right? You, you've thankfully a buffet, right? You've lined up all my customers for me and you've given them all a technology where they need something that I'm going to make that you're not going to make. And, I, and everything I make is going to work perfectly with their devices because... You, you made them so that they could, uh, so that they were of a standard gauge. The same thing happened a few years later when the Bell system came up against another case called Carter Phone. Carter Phone made a, a walkie-talkie to phone bridge for ranch hands. So you'd, you'd connect the, the walkie-talkie base station to your RJ11 phone jack and your wall and your, in the barn, and then it would retransmit it to uh, out on the range. So ranch hands could, could, uh, could talk you know, could pick up the phone when they were out. And um, when they lost that case, they lost the presumption that they can control a, a, uh, electrical coupling to the bell system as well. And again, it was a bonanza for for third parties. Network effects build uh, uh, services, but they but switching costs keep them uh, to the scale that they've attained. So there's nothing intrinsic to Facebook that says that if you leave Facebook, you have to leave behind your friends. Um, you know, that all the benefits that caused you to join Facebook should be available to you or could be available to you if you left Facebook. If you, you know, leave T-Mobile and switch to AT&T, your friends don't even know, right? It's not, it's not just that you can give them your new phone number. You can keep your phone number. They don't even see that you've left, right? You, you just keep talking to them. 
And so they have a pretty low switching cost. They've, they've tried to raise it from time to time. There was the, the golden age for the carriers of the subsidy phone where they could lock phones to, to carriers. And there were lots of other measures that they used to try and lock you in, like um, offering you discounts on affiliated companies' data packages. So you see that with the T-Mobile, with AT&T and HBO Max and T-Mobile doing uh, sweetheart deals with different uh, streamers and so on. But um, you know, the, at the end of the day, if you don't like how they treat you, you can go and you don't have to give anything up. Facebook and other big tech platforms, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and so on, have engineered out the interoperability that was latent, latent in their technology. So they've deliberately designed their technology so that it's hard to interoperate with. And then they have secured for themselves regulation, law, and jurisprudence that cuts against third parties engineering it back in. So to give you an example of how that worked, uh, back in 2000, I was a CIO, was running um, big heterogeneous networks of window machines and Mac machines. And um, the Macs were at a huge disadvantage because of Microsoft Office. Uh, the, there was a version of Office for the Mac in the early 2000s, but it was cursed. Uh, if you got a document from your Windows compatriots and you opened it on your Mac, chances were uh, it wouldn't render correctly. Uh, and if you were unwise enough to save it and pass it back to a Windows user, it would probably be permanently corrupted and unopenable. And uh, rather than go on bent knee to um, Steve Jobs or to Bill Gates, Steve Jobs said, I'm just going to have some of my engineers reverse engineer this file format. And I'm going to make uh, the iWork suite, um, which is uh, um, keynote numbers and pages that just reads and writes these file formats. And after they did that, after they ran the switch campaign where they said, you know, it's easier than you think to, 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 to switch from a Windows machine to a Mac because you can take your documents with you and you can collaborate with third parties, especially since there was a substrate of interoperability technologies. Most notably in the office, there was a thing called Samba. So SMB is Microsoft's networking protocol. It's how they connected early PCs to each other. And it was proprietary. And an Australian graduate student reverse engineered it and made this thing that plugged into Samba, uh, SMB called Samba. And Apple and all the other companies like Oracle and Sun, they all poured resources into making Samba work uh, so that every device could use Samba. And today all your devices have Samba on them. Your phone has Samba on it. Everything has Samba on it. And so, you know, you could, you could just exchange documents fluidly with people in your, in your network because you had Samba, even though Samba had started as a Windows, uh, networking protocol. And when you did that, you could then share files with them without worrying about file corruption. And so it really, I think it's, it's not overstating it to say it rescued the Mac and after it rescued the Mac. Microsoft stopped obfuscating its file formats and went to a standards body to standardize them. That's where PPTX and XLSX and DOCX, they all come from Microsoft throwing in the towel because maintaining non-interoperable file formats was a significant business challenge, right? It, it actually uh, required them to figure out how to support what amounted to like 30 different file formats in a single application so that it would always be a moving target so that the people who were uh, trying to make interoperable pro-competitive elements uh, would be stymied because Microsoft could outspend them with the engineering needed for it. And that it, it was an exp ex uh, exponential rise in engineering support because you then you go from having to support one version of Word talking to another version of Word to having a third version of Word that has to talk to the previous two, and then a fourth that needs to talk to the previous three, and then they all need to talk to it. And so you end up with this exponential growth in engineering challenges. So Microsoft became a good actor in the face of uh, interoperability, this, this, this specific kind of interoperability that at Electronic Frontier Foundation, we used to call adversarial interoperability to contrast with, with cooperative interoperability where you go to a standards body and you standard something, standardize something or even in different inter interoperability. So like if you've ever been down to the gas station and bought uh, a 50 cent USB charger adapter for your car cigarette lighter out of a fishbowl, you know, the, the Ford doesn't care that you're doing that. They're not making it easier for those people. They're also not trying to stop them. It's just this kind of indifferent interoperability. It's like using your KitchenAid to mix paint. Like they, they're not going to tell you to do it. They're not going to try and stop you to do it. 
it's just it's just there but this adversarial interoperability um is is really shot through the history of technology and when you hear people tell the story of the naive tech bro who in the 1990s thought that if we just connected everyone to the internet everything would be great because the internet was intrinsically competitive you could reach new audiences whatever the blind spot that those people had was not that they underestimated the risks of technology right like barlow didn't found the electronic frontier foundation because he thought everything would be fine right like barlow's barlow's ethos was this is all going to be great if we don't screw it up and if we do it's going to be catastrophic what barlow and i think the rest of the optimists of that early age really missed was the role that interoperability adversarial interoperability played in the dynamism of the early tech industry and how fragile the assumption that adversarial interoperability would be available to us turned out to be that when once a firm could consolidate its gains and extract both monopoly rents and the political power that comes from being central to so many people's lives from being too big to fail that they would be able to argue as tech firms have for decades that the computer fraud and abuse act makes it a felony to uh, bypass terms of service that was only struck down by the supreme court last summer it was the presumption from 1986 until then right as tech firms were able to to make it bigger and bigger and and wider and wider in its interpretation facebook actually successfully fended off a company called power ventures for violating its terms of service for making a thing that let you read Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter in the same dashboard, which would have been a way to turn Facebook into a commodity and something that was not where you didn't have to subject yourself to Facebook scrutiny in order to get the benefits of Facebook. You could add block and you could uh, not have uh, direct observation of your behavior and so on. You could just take that all out of Facebook's all seeing eye. And so, you know, it wasn't until last summer that the Supreme Court finally struck it down. And for decades, this was a huge piece of what venture capitalists call the kill zone, where no one wanted to invest in these businesses that were adjacent to the turf that had been staked out by big tech firms that were realizing double digit year on year gains in their profitability, which had soared into the billions. And VCs were like, that's their money. It's not our job to try and get their money from them. Um, that money is off limits to the companies we fund which is a remarkable and strange thing. You know, I'm not a true believer in markets, but I think that it's somewhat axiomatic that if you have a firm that extracts such high margins and, su and experiences such growth, that somewhere out there is a capitalist who dreams of taking some of that money for themselves. And the fact that those capitalists weren't there, I think should, should uh, shock us and give us uh, cause for concern. So, this this adversarial interoperability, and I said we used to call it adversarial interop interoperability, we stopped because one of the places where there's a lot of um, energy and support of it is in Europe and specifically in Germany, and Germans cannot say adversarial interoperability for the same reason I can't pronounce Fingerspitzengefühl correctly. And um, we, we came up with another term, we call it competitive compatibility or com, -com uh, which is much more fun to say, easier to write, has a, you know, shorter and Germans can pronounce it. So, uh, you know, this, this com, com approach is really important. And it's really important to the, this equitable enterprise idea because while regulation is something I believe in, and I believe in a muscular state that intervenes to correct problems with markets and to achieve policy goals uh, that are key to a, a thriving, uh and and decent society where that we can all be proud to live in i have spent 20 years in the regulatory trenches and it's slow it's slow and so we need in addition to jam tomorrow and jam yesterday we need jam today and that's what ComCom -com gets you so to give you an example in 2012 massachusetts's bay staters went to the ballot box for a line item initiative, a ballot initiative, question one, that was about whether or not manufacturers of cars could be forced to turn over diagnostic tools uh, and other information to independent mechanics 
so that the right to repair could be preserved in Massachusetts, so that independent mechanics could stay in business. Increasingly, these firms had been um, encrypting the data that went on the CAN bus, that's the wired network that's in the car, that's used for diagnostics and communication among the components, and it had been freezing out independent mechanics. And so they um, voted overwhelmingly for this. It passed w w with something like 80% of the electorate in favor of it. And there was a very high turnout. Almost everyone who marked a ballot paper uh, in the election also marked this question. It's just kind of a no-brainer, right? Should you be able to choose who fixes your car? And uh, immediately after the passage of this law, maybe even before in anticipation of it, the automakers started to retool so that the diagnostic information that independent mechanics needed didn't go on the CAN bus, on this wired network that was covered by the mandate that had been created in the in the um, ballot question. Instead, they started to transmit it wirelessly. And wireless networks have been carved out of the ballot question. Now, last year, 2020, Bay Staters went back to the ballot box for a very consequential election. And once again, overwhelmingly, with just short of 80%, marked their ballot papers in favor of a rule that would force the big three automakers to also provide diagnostics for wireless information and they sued the automaker sued it hasn't come into effect yet and that's the speed of regulation right an, an interoperability mandate can always uh, be subverted by a dominant actor and they can make a kind of microeconomic calculus about like how much money are we going to make from this and how much money is this going to cost us when we get caught right when we get smacked down and if the if the calculus is it falls on the wrong side or is even colorably on the wrong side because so many of these firms are just sort of uh completely lawless in their view and and think that they'll that they can avoid most consequences for bad action they will subvert the mandate right if i say you must have a tap on the front of your house to help the fire department but i forget to say and you're not allowed to disconnect the water from the tap then it's possible to have the, the, the thing on the front of your house and not have it do any good. And, and I fear that if we were to mandate, say that Facebook open up an API, as is being contemplated by Congress right now in the Access Act, which was reintroduced in this legislative session after dying in the Senate last session, it's back in the House this session. Um, if, if, if we were to mandate Facebook's API, I think there's a pretty good chance that they would comply with the rule and then just restructure their data so that the API doesn't do you any good, right? So that it wouldn't be of any use to an interoperator who popped up. But imagine if there was some mechanism by which interoperability without permission could be preserved. And so that firms had to incorporate that into their calculus. So imagine if ComCom was legal. And there are lots of ways that we can get, get there and I'll, I'll mention them at the end. But um, if the automakers had broken diagnostics in 2012 in response to the Massachusetts mandate, then a couple of smart MIT kids could have gone into business building a wireless diagnostic tool with a bill of materials of, you know, $10 made in Shenzhen and a, and a, a retail cost of $100. And they could have sold it across America. And every mechanic who bought one would have had one less reason to ever talk to the automakers. So it would have been a platform that they could have used to build out other services like access to third-party parts and unlock codes to make those parts work because increasingly those third-party parts uh, require an unlock code to get them to work with the engine because it's all networked. All these components are networked. Um, and with each uh, success that this firm had, the automakers would have to either eat crow, right? Accept a lower margin or go to war and fight guerrilla war with them by retooling all of their diagnostic codes, all of their parts, all of their unlock codes, and then pay the, the price in not just engineering costs, but collateral damage, because all of their authorized mechanics would need to be retooled every time they changed it. So they would, they would have to bear a completely unquantifiable set of risks to engage in guerrilla warfare. Now, I... Um, write angry things about tech platforms and periodically i make them 
frustrated and angry enough with me that I speak to their policy people. And when I talk to their policy people, they all say that they would much rather have a mandate than guerrilla warfare. That a mandate is something that they can bank on, right? They can plan on, they can tell their investors what to expect about, right? Guerrilla warfare, if you were to, if Facebook had to contend with third parties who were lawfully permitted to use bots and scrapers and reverse engineering to attain what the API used to attain before they broke it, they would not only have to devote a significant amount of engineering resource to that, they would also have to be able to distinguish bots and scrapers and reverse engineers from their 3 billion users. And 3 billion users generate 3 million or 3,000 one in a million use cases every day. So they're going to end up catching an awful lot of dolphins in that tuna net, right? They're going to, they're going to end up with a lot of collateral damage. So I think that there is a, at least a good chance that if we were to mandate interoperability and also legalize self-help measures for firms who are frustrated by the breaking of interoperability, that we could establish an equilibrium in which firms would prefer to color within the lines because the alternative was worse. And if they did that, then you enable the kind of self-determination that we care about when we talk about equitable enterprise, right? If you think that Facebook's moderation stinks and everybody thinks Facebook's moderation stinks, right? If, you're, if your speech isn't being moderated, you're angry because other people's speech is. And if your speech is being moderated, you're angry because other people's speech isn't. Like nobody likes their moderation norms because you cannot create a three ring binder fat enough to capture all of the conversational norms of 3 billion users, right? And so they will never be able to do moderation at scale. Uh, I don't care how many magic beans they throw at the AI department, it's never gonna grow into a beanstalk that gets them to the giant's cloud where all moderation problems are solved. But you could have a standalone diaspora instance or some other third party thing that allowed you to talk to your friends at Facebook that didn't require that you leave behind your Facebook friends to join it but that could continue the conversation with a moderation norm that reflected your community norm. And that wasn't responsible for ensuring that, that Facebook uh, uh, thought that your norms were good norms. Um, you could have whatever you wanted. And you know, when you look at the qualitative and quantitative research about bad speech on Facebook, you see that these standalone platforms that are kind of little cesspools like 4chan, they have a relatively small number of users in which they coordinate big runs at Facebook, which is the place where they actually get their bulk and action from. So they have a Vanguard sitting there in their private space, but it's the 3 billion user space that is essential to all the bad speech acts that we're worried about. So we need to, we need to shatter that space. We need to break it up. We need to do it quickly. We need to do it faster than um, a regulatory breakup could accomplish. You know, IBM spent 12 years being uh, threatened with a breakup and ultimately was spared. Microsoft spent seven years and was ultimately spared. AT&T was broken up in 1982, but the breakup action against AT&T began in the 1930s. I don't think we want to wait 50 years for Facebook to be broken up. So we can have a remedy right away that weakens its power and hegemony and returns to people the self-determination that we care about. So the last thing I want to talk about is how do we get ComCom legalized. Even if we can get this, the Access Act through Congress, or if the Digital Markets Act passes in the European Union, or any of these other uh, uh, acts that that pr purport to require interop gets there, how do we stop them from being subverted? And I think the way that we do it is by uh, is with with a two pronged attack. So the first one is that we need to have some rules of the road. Um, Facebook and Apple and Google and Salesforce and every other big platform will tell you that uh, they are guardians of their users' privacy when they're not invading their users' privacy. So Facebook rejects all kinds of invasive conduct by its partners all the time. Uh, it just doesn't reject its own invasive conduct or invasive conduct by partners whom it values, those it enables and prevents you from taking self-help measures. You know, Facebook's claim that if they were forced to interoperate, they wouldn't be able to defend us from Cambridge Analytica is somewhat weakened by the fact that they already failed to defend us from Cambridge Analytica. 
So perhaps we shouldn't trust them to do that. Um, but uh, we do need privacy rules, right? We, it is true that a Chinese state-owned enterprise or another Cambridge Analytica or you know, a data brokerage could, could figure out how to trick people into setting up accounts that were interoperating with Facebook and then be more invasive than Facebook, not less. And I think the only way we accomplish good rules of the road is not by deputizing Facebook to decide what is and isn't the acceptable boundary of, of privacy. Not even Apple should have that role, especially not after their, the recent debacle in which they uh, announced that they would non-consensually begin scanning your phone for images that they thought might be illegal, right? I mean, they, they clearly are not like perfect. Uh, and, you know, as we see, like the only remedy we have when Apple is imperfect is to embarrass them to the point where they step back as opposed to, you know, seeking a legal remedy or electing someone new or asking to have the notice of proposed rulemaking be reconsidered or whatever we would get if it were a democratically controlled rule. So I think we need a freestanding privacy law. Um, and And I think that there's never been a moment where it was more credible that America could get a freestanding privacy law. I think we're we're damn close. Um, this is the this is the moment at which the whole idea that a privacy law shouldn't exist is being discredited by the firms who fought it themselves. And so I think that's that that's that's what we need. I think if if you've looked at the GDPR and said, well, a freestanding privacy law isn't solving problems there, I would I would ask you to dig a little deeper into the GDPR's enforcement mechanism. So the GDPR has a bunch of an onshore tax havens in it. Uh, those are where the tech companies headquarter or European Union rather has a lot of onshore tax havens. That's where the European companies headquarter and the way that the GDPR is structured is the national um, uh, privacy commissioner, information commissioner in each member state is responsible for enforcement against the firms that are headquartered there. So Ireland allows firms to maintain the risible pretext that their money isn't anywhere, that it's like floating in international waters in the Irish Sea somewhere, and so therefore cannot be taxed by anyone. And as a result, it is the headquarters of all the big tech firms and the Irish uh, ICO, Information Commissioner's Office, they don't even put on pants in the morning. They just sit around in their pajamas eating cereal. When you look at their actual like uh, uh, prosecution track record, that like Germany is doing 500 cases a year with no tech giants and they're doing like 12. And so, yeah, there's a huge enforcement problem. It doesn't tell you the GDPR doesn't work. There are other problems with the GDPR, but like the GDPR structural prohibitions on privacy invasion are fine. It's just that, you know, that there's a sleeping regulator in the, in the mix. And, you know, that's the thing the commission should fix. I talk to them about it a lot. I'm going over in December to talk to them about it. You know, they, they need to do something about this because it's making a mockery of it. So we need a freestanding privacy law. And then we need something that permits interoperability, adversarial interoperability, ComCom. And that can come in a number of ways. So procurement's a good one. Uh, Uncle Sam buys a lot of stuff. Uh, and there is a very strong case to be made that it is only prudent to require second sourcing and interoperability uh, covenants from state suppliers that, you know, the you just shouldn't, like no school board should have bought Google Classroom uh, during the lockdown without a promise from Google that you could plug in third-party learning modules that even if Google didn't like them. And it's just, just irresponsible to spend money that way. This has a very long and honorable tradition. Uh, during the Civil War, the Union Army told rifle makers that they had to sell interoperable ammunition and parts for the rifles, that they had to, to, to um, promise to eschew any remedies against competitors who made interoperable parts and, and bullets because their profits weren't as important as the army's ability to fight the war. Uh, today, you know, sadly, the, well, I'm not a, I, I'm a anti-war person, so I'm not going to say sadly, I would like the Pentagon dismantled, but sadly for the Pentagon, it has forgotten this ethic. Um, David Dian in, in his book Monopolized has an incredible chapter on aerospace procurement where there's a ton of single source suppliers for key aerospace components and private equity firms have been rolling up these single source suppliers. They bought them all and they have dropped the price to the primary uh, um, military contractors like Boeing on their, on their products to significantly below cost, like effectively free. Put this in a fighter jet, we'll give it to you for free. But the replacement parts market comes with a million percent markup. So they've guaranteed that every, every uh, jet will need the part. And then they charge 
just shocking amounts of money for those parts. So there's a really good argument that we should just say interop should be there uh, and if you buy stuff from the government. And then that gets exported to the private sector because now there's APIs, there's all that stuff that, that we need. I think we could also do it by creating um, contractual limitations. So in California, for example, non-compete agreements are uh, not contractually valid as against public policy. We could say that um, certain other contractual provisions uh, like anti-reverse engineering provisions in terms of service are non-enforceable as against public policy. We could build them into settlements for antitrust action. So it's pretty, pretty clear from Facebook's track record that they're eventually gonna offer Lena Khan a settlement uh, uh, to go away. One of the things that Lena could ask for is a special master who sits on Facebook's chest and every time they, they say, well, we're gonna sue someone, the special master gets to figure out whether or not the lawsuit is anti-competitive, whether it's about shutting down an interoperator, or we could, you know, and this is ambitious, we could embed a new legal defense in law. We could say, uh, you know, an interoperator's defense, notwithstanding copyright, patent, terms of service, tortious interference, or any other legal theory, it is never, it is never an offense to uh, create parts, affect a repair, uh, audit for security purposes, improve the security of, add accessibility to, increase the privacy of, or in other ways legitimately improve a uh, product or service, even if it makes the shareholders of the company that made that product or service sad. So we could just say we don't have felony contempt of business model in America. That's not how it works, right? So I, I think we need them both. I think we need the mandate and I think we need the self-help measure. And I think that uh, I'll, I'll close by saying that when I talk about the self-help measures to non-technical audiences, they often evince skepticism that they would work just as a practical matter. They say, Facebook has all the engineers, Apple has all the engineers, Google has all the engineers. How are you gonna reverse engineer what they make and make something that plugs into it? And I think that that's a, a reasonable sounding question, but not one that chimes for people who have a computer science background because computers are interoperable by design, by nature. You know, the, the general purpose Turing complete von Neumann machine that is the modern computer and the only computer we know how to make, right? We don't know how to make the almost Turing complete computer. We can't make a computer that goes inside your printer that only runs the program that directs the print heads to print out your pages and doesn't also run Doom and malicious software. Right. We, we just put like the same kind of computer that's in your desktop and your printer and it's the same that's in your digital watch and your singing greeting card and it can run all the programs we can express in symbolic logic. We, we actually contend with the universality of computers as a problem in computer science and no one's ever figured out how to make the non interoperable computer, which is why they use the law. And so if we get the law out of the way. If we if we make it so that Facebook does have to fight guerrilla technological warfare instead of availing itself of the people's courts to shut down the guerrilla warfare, then we shift the equilibrium in favor of the technological self-determination that the concentration in the tech sector has robbed us of. Thank you.